name is Eric Parsons. I'm an associate teaching professor. I'm also the director of undergraduate studies in our department at the University of Missouri Columbia. A bit of context, I teach the large lecture intro principles of micro classes. So every semester I have two sections that will have anywhere between 350 to 700 students, uh, 350 to 500 students per section. So I have 700 to 1,000 myself. And then there's normally a third section that I oversee. It's the same class. We have the same Canvas course. Everybody's in the same Canvas course. They take the exams in the evening at the same time. So it really is the same class. The third one, I'm just not lecturing, um, but I'm still overseeing that one. So very big lectures, mostly in person, a little bit online. Obviously, during the pandemic, it was a, a mix of things. Um, I do also teach a graduate class. Um, we have a Truman School of Public Affairs, University of Missouri. Uh, it's a fully online program. And so I teach the online economic analysis for public, uh, for public policy, which is actually a lot like principles of micro, but with a, a policy um, spin to it and more, more practical ap applications and so on. And then prior to working at Mizzou, I actually taught for five years at a community college in Kansas City. So I appreciated Eric's presentation of the two year versus four year. Um, I love my community colleges. I still stay in touch with some people I worked with there. Excellent, excellent teachers across the board. And then I was a Peace Corps volunteer, like many ages ago now. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Uganda for two years. So that's a little bit about me. But we're going to dive right into the interaction here. So one way, like talking about doing introductions in a big classroom, in a large lecture, you can't go around and have everybody introduce themselves. But the beginning of every, every semester, I do ask some questions to students that they respond with like to get a feel um, for the room. So here's one of them I ask. Where are you from? So one nice thing about iClicker, and I should mention, right, um, some of you have probably used iClicker a lot, maybe some others a little bit. Um, everyone who uses Achieve, you have access to iClicker um, through Achieve, and the students have access to it already through the ebook. Scott promised me that, right? So, um, so you know, you have the, the ability to do it with no extra cost because it's already included in the Achieve fee. So just keep that in mind. At Mizzou, interestingly, our entire university has a site license, so we have two different ways that the students can access it. So one nice thing about iClicker is they have a variety of different types of questions. One is a click on target question. So I'm gonna get this question going. When I hit go here, that picture should show up on your screen. So put a dot where you're at, hit submit. If you are not from the United States, I apologize. I could have done a world map, but I had a feeling the audience would make it, the, this one makes the most sense to the audience. Alaska, Hawaii, also I apologize. You can go, go up in those areas. I do a world map, I, always, I have like a state of Missouri map, a US map, and a world map for my students. Um, when I do the world map, it's amazing how many students we have from Greenland, Siberia, and North Korea. So um, I thought I would stick to the, the lower 48 on this one. So if you've never used iClicker, one nice thing, you can kind of see this running count. So I have like, there's 34 people, 36 people now who've responded. You get a feel for how many people are in the classroom. You can kind of know, okay, we're, we've hit kind of the upper limit. I'm going to stop this one, show the results. All right, we see nice representation from all over, probably perhaps not surprising, more on East Coast than West Coast. It's a long way from here. A lot of people from Texas, it looks like. That's great. Um, we have some people from Atlantis, so that's always good, too. <laughs> so... So that's our first click on target, right? Um, students always tend to have fun with these. So why iClicker? So a little bit more introduction, then we're gonna, gonna have some more iClicker questions later. That'll be the focus at the end. So why iClicker? We first started using this when I first started teaching principles. I was teaching with uh, a, another professor who has since retired, and he had an 8 a.m. class. He also, that was the year we've been trying to be fairly technology forward in the class. We started recording. Back then it was Tegrity. Now we use Panopto for those people familiar with those technologies. So we were recording the lectures and it was 8 a.m. As you can probably guess, attendance not so good because um, they're like, oh, I can just watch a video. I'm not going to wake up that early to go to class. So we initially used iClicker largely as an attendance incentive, um, which it still is. And I think it does a good job of that. But over time, I found it to be much more valuable than just incentivizing attendance. For one, it allows even a very large lecture, you get participation, you get engagement from the students. Um, I'll mention this later as well, but every time I do an iClicker question, I tell them like, think pair share, talk to your neighbor, get in small groups, figure this out. Um, so it allows for interaction and so on. It breaks up the large lecture into smaller chunks. Um, so it's like more manage manageable sizes. You have these nice breaks built in. 
And it obviously helps you check student understanding. Like, okay, they didn't get this one. Like we need to um, revise that or so on and so forth. So it has more to it than just that attendance component. I think the attendance component is important. Um, back in 2018, our institution did the AQ um, Association of University Educators um, Affecting Teachers Practices course. I was like one of the first cohorts to go through it at our school. And most of the teaching strategies that they gave were designed for like small discussion based classes, which is not my class. And so the only way that I was able to like at least somewhat replicate the things they were wanting us to do was to use iClicker. I used iClicker very heavily that semester and I continue to use it heavily. Um, some things I kept, some things I didn't. But like being able to use this was the only way I could kind of capture those experiences they were trying to, trying to get us to do um, in that course. So some policy basics, like how do I set this up? Over time, I've changed how I've done this a few times. So I'm always fiddling with the class, trying to hit that, that perfect spot, which probably never get there. The, when I first started using this, it was, like I said, it was focused more on attendance. So we gave it 5% of the overall course grade it was based on iClicker, but we did participation only. We didn't count the questions right or wrong. Just did you answer? That was it, um, which I thought worked fairly well. Pandemic came along, obviously changed things. We mixed it up a little bit. Um, went to extra credit. So we gave them like one percentage point of extra credit, but we started counting them if they were right or wrong. Um, one of my thoughts here was I've discovered over time that like the student elasticity to extra credit is sometimes more than to regular credit. And this is the only room I could ever say that, that it, people would understand what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> Along multiple dimensions. So this actually worked pretty well um, when we were doing it. And, and I did notice that when we started counting correctness, huge surprise here, there seemed to be a bit more effort um, put forth by, by the students um, in answering the questions correctly. I'm trying something new this semester and I actually quite like it so far. So now it's not actually counting for any credit in the class, but if they get 60% or more, like the awe oh, goes over the crowd, right? So 60% or more correct over the course of the semester, they don't have to take the final. Right, so I use the Cowan and Tabrock book. I apologize to the other authors in the room. Um, but big idea number one, incentives matter. This is a big incentive. <laughs> the students, I've noticed less attendance bleed. We're getting close at Mizzou about, we're almost halfway through the semester now. I've noticed much less attendance bleed throughout this semester than I have seen in previous semesters. So this is actually working really well. And it's got correctness in it too. So students like actually are trying and getting this. I always used to joke, that in a big lecture, you never get 100% correct. It's like the unicorn, right? Like I've, in, before this semester, once or twice, now, at least somewhat often, we get 100% on a, a relatively easy question. So this seems to be working. Um, so I, I kind of like this one so far. And as I mentioned, I always encourage the students to talk to each other, work with each other on that. Two other useful features I wanna talk about on iClicker before we jump into some questions, geofencing. If it's an in-person class, you can set a physical boundary and they have to be within that geofence to answer the questions. So they can't just be hanging out in their dorm rooms um, and answering the questions from there. You can turn this off though, right? So if it's an online class or a, a hybrid, a mix, this is what we did during the pandemic. You can still have the synchronous questions, but they don't have to be in the room. And Macmillan has lots of pre-made iClicker slides. So you don't have to necessarily come up with all these on your own. They have slides built that you can, can bring in. I have, have one of these worked in as well. Another feature I didn't include here, and the only reason I didn't is I haven't had a chance to try it myself yet. I keep saying I'm going to and I haven't done it yet. There is a focus mode. Um, a lot of people worry that they're just gonna be on their laptops, on their phones, not paying attention. And they are, um, that is true. But there is a focus mode, or at least some of them. There is a focus mode that you can kind of track that data and you could actually use that to, to try to rein that in a little bit if, that, if that's a concern um, to think about. So now we're gonna dive into some questions. All the econ based ones should be gimmies, but I think it's more fun if we walk through them, all right? So part of this is the idea of like, how can we go beyond just using just standard multiple choice type questions um, in our classes? One thing that I like to use is question sequences. So taking a problem, breaking it down into bits and like do a sequence of multiple questions in a row that get us there. So first one, I have a demand graph here. How much total revenue does the firm earn if we have two units of output? So this is numeric. So another type of question, we have to type in a number on this one that should be ready to go. So if we have two units of output with this demand curve, what is our total revenue? Got very silent. 
you are allowed to think pair share. All right, we're going to cut this one, or in the interest of time, we might not hit every single one. We might just talk about some of them. So I'm going to hit stop here. It is anonymous, so you don't have to worry about that thing. <laughs> Hopefully it's not a problem, but there's always, there's always some, right? So hit results. The nice thing, you can count, uh, you can sort, right? So you can sort by the most common answer. Most common answer was 16, which is, of course, the correct answer, right? So then I pop up the slide, graphically show what it is as well. We can get the calculation. The second one I'm going to skip in the interest of time, but we'll go to the third one. So in this, we do this question, right? Okay, now, what if it's three instead of two, right? Normally, that first question they do decently on. On this one, everyone tends to get it right because they've seen how the problem works, right? So we know, okay, we have to lower the price, times three, seven times three is 21. And then the payoff, right? Students struggle with this idea of marginal. So we will do this one. What is the marginal revenue of that third unit? I always remind them if they took good notes, this should be a gimme. <laughs> If they didn't take, don't take good notes, might not be quite as much of a gimme. So, all right, we'll cut this one off once again. My questions don't count for anything. So let's see what we got. So, all right, we can sort it out. And then once again, we can show the answer. And I can show it two ways, using the two previous ones, or if you wanna kind of show the extra revenue versus the lost revenue from the lower price, and it's the same and then illustrate the point that the marginal revenue is below the price with this downward sloping demand curve, right? So you can lead them to the answer. Another type of question I like to use are those target questions. I'm sure many of you struggle with what I like to call visual numeracy. The students have trouble reading, interpreting, manipulating, understanding graphs. And I think the, the click on target questions are great for that. So let's do another fun one of those. Here we have supply and demand, but we're not at equilibrium, right? We have a price of $20. So producers are only willing to sell 20 units. So let's find our deadweight loss. We could, act, we could give letters, right? We could ask them to calculate it because there's numbers. But I think there's something useful about them looking at the graph and pointing to it. So it's going to be another target question. That should be showing up for you now. So you can put the dot in the middle. Obviously, it won't cover the whole area. Put the dot in the middle. Hit submit. So let's see what we got. Um, students really like these because you get this big purple dot, which sometimes looks more like a Rorschach block than anything useful, right? But I think they're always excited, like, what's, what's the picture going to look like, right? So we can see where people thought it was and where it was, right? There's our dead weight loss because we're, we're underproducing. All right. This one, I think we'll skip this one just in the interest of time. Um, but once again, this is in, more using data and a chart. This is one of the pre-made slides. So this is one that you can get from the mill and slide decks. Looking at the data on these prices of washing machines, when did the, the tariff go in place, right? Well, we know it's when the price spiked up after that long decline, we get the spike up. So once again, if we had more time, we'd hit all of these. But in the interest of time, I want to get to some of the later ones, which I think are interesting. We can also be creative. There is no ranking question in iClicker, but there is a text question in iClicker, right? So, this will be one we'll just, because it takes a little bit of time to put, punch this one in, but to just kind of illustrate ranking elasticities from most elastic to least elastic. And I give them the format, like type this in as a text, capital A, B, C, D. I like to give the format because there's always someone who, like even no matter how many times I say capitals, no spaces, no commas, there's always capitals, uh, lowercase, you know, spaces and commas as well. You'll probably still get it to some extent, but you can get this in, you can rank them, right? You can see which one's the most common answer. Right, and then we can you know, display the answer. We're going from long run to short run, from local to national, national to global, plus using something that uses up more of the input, right? So we can go through and kind of hit those points. So we can be creative in what the tools we have to get other types of questions. But what I really like iClicker for is not these subjective questions. Oh, they're great, right? I think those are fine. But I like to pull the students just to get information. And these are freebies. They like, all get credit as long as they answer. So they like these as well, right? It gets them closer to that 60%. And I use these for a variety of, of ways. One is for usable data. So Shakespeare's Pizza, famous pizza place in Columbia, right? So this is one, um, and we'll, we'll run this one just because it's fun. Sub in your favorite local pizza place, right? We did just have lunch, so people maybe aren't so hungry right now. But 
how much would you pay for a single slice of pizza from your favorite pizza place? Let's say if you were very hungry or something like that, all right? So this is numeric. I ask them to round to the nearest 50 cents so we can get groupings in the data as opposed to just having stuff all over the place. So and the reason I want to run this is I kind of want to show what the data looks like um, on these at the end. All right, I think most people have answered now. So then we can go in here, you can sort them by the most popular, $5, $4, $7, $3. And I think everyone in this room can understand how we could use this data, right? If you had time, you could do a whole like activity in class where we calculate, we set a market price, like let's say the price is $3 per slice of pizza and say, okay, someone making, who's willing to pay $3 gets no consumer surplus. 2.5 gets nothing because they don't buy it, right? That's an obviously a common mistake. You could draw a demand curve. You could calculate the overall consumer surplus for the entire class using this data. So it's a nice way just to gather some data um, and then use it in a, in a useful way and the, the students find that interesting. So in addition, to, in addition to polling for data purposes, sometimes I use it to illustrate a concept. So here's one freebie question, right? But if you have a sensitive gender specific medical issue, which doctor do you prefer to see? So I always tell students just go with their guts, be honest on this one. It's all anonymous, so we'll run this one. And uh, yeah, so for these types of questions, I count everything as correct. Um, and so it's freebie questions for the students, right? And so then we can reveal the answer. And this actually is pretty close to what I see with my students, right? So a decent chunk will say, you know, first appointment, best doctor, but there's a reasonable chunk that are gonna say same gender, Right, so then you can discuss how, you know, consumer-based discrimination and lead into discussions of that and how, like, consumer preferences can have outcomes um, in the market and so on. You can also use these to motivate a topic. So when we do price ceilings, price floors, I always open the chapter with these two questions. So, should we allow a market for kidneys? In other words, should, you allow, should it be allowed that you get a payment Provide it to provide your kidney to someone who needs a kidney transplant. All right, let's see what we got on this one. Once again, everyone gets credit on these. So, so a room of economists, right? It's a bit more. What's in at college students? College students are even more like all on board of this, right? Like sell any body part for money. Like it's over 80% in every one of my classes does this. And I always make the point like, if we pulled the general public, it would not look like this. Um, that's why there's no market. So, um, so I think that's a nice one that leads into discussion of price ceilings. And then obviously when we talk about price floors, make this one numeric, round to the nearest 50 cents so we get that grouping. What do you think the minimum wage should be? And I also let them know that you can select an answer of zero if you think there shouldn't be a minimum wage. So that's an option too. All right, let's see what we think. All right, there we go. 15 is the most popular, 12, 10, 20, zero. Um, when I did this, just we did this actually just in class this past week, the 60-ish percent of students would probably be between 10 and 15, like that's the most, most common response that you see there. Obviously it leads into discussion of price floors, minimum wages, and so on. One thing that I think would be interesting to know, I've done this once or twice, but never actually looked at the data, is do these questions before and after the chapter and see does like the distribution of answers shift um, when, we, when we do that. And then I think also, we, I started out talking about question sequences. You can do this to motivate a topic as well. So here's a quest, series, a, a sequence of questions that I use to kind of motivate the topic of statistical discrimination. So we'll run through these and that'll be it for me. So first question, do you think it is okay for young men to be charged higher auto insurance rates? All right, let's see. Let's see what the crowd says on this one. So yes, in a college student class, it's more 50-50, probably because half of them are young men, right? <laughs> and so, so you, you get a, but I think this is, a, this is more close to the general public view on that one. So 
Next question. Do you think it's okay for obese people to be charged higher health insurance rates? All right, let's see what we've got on this one. A bit closer to 50-50. Someone was undecided and voted C. So a bit, a bit closer to 50-50. One more in the sequence. Do you think it's okay with people with genetic markers for cancer to be charged higher health insurance rates? All right, let's see where we stand on this one. And then once again, go that way. And so I think it, aside from the weird anomaly of college students and for the first question on car insurance, I would expect that this is kind of the way this will go. We can see, I, I love the sequence of questions because there's so much you can unpack in, unpack in this sequence first. We can say, ignoring the context, right? If we just look statistically, actuarially, these are the same situation. They're getting charged more because they're a higher cost customer, right? So just from a straight statistics standpoint, these are exactly the same. But then we can also highlight the point that despite that there's like no animosity or animus here, the group that's being discriminated against has higher costs. They have a negative outcome. And then we can apply that um, to other contexts as well. And then I think we also allow us to bring in this last point that how we feel about statistical discrimination is like hugely context based, right? Sometimes we think it's okay to have statistical discrimination. Other times we don't think it's okay. Um, and you can kind of get some discussion going like what are the underlying causes of that as well. But like, this is a nice sequence that leads to lots of deeper questions on this topic and like opens up the topic of statistical discrimination. Mm -hmm.